podcast. Yeah, yeah. Tune it for the audio, or you can even watch back. Yeah. Giving players all the props, or put them on blast. We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. You know that we can hold it down Shout out to my man Sammy Got it off the ground And to all the listeners Tuned in right now Got debates, analysis, and speculation This is sports talk for the new generation You know where to find us Got a reputation Sick podcast, your number one sports destination We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah Cause this is our time No way, no stopping us Till we reach the finish line All in, we came in a win We're gonna give everything S-I-C-K On the run S-I-C-K Sick, sick On fire, we're ready to fight We'll bring the house down tonight S-I-C-K On the run S-I-C-K Sickest podcast, tune in for the audio, or you can even watch back. Giving players all the props, or put them on blast. We don't give no hot takes, only talk back. S I C K, S I C K, S I C K, S I C K, For the audio, or you can even watch back. Giving players all the props, or put them on blast. We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. You know that we can hold it down Shout out to my man Sammy Got it off the ground And to all the listeners tuned in right now Got debates, analysis, and speculation This is sports talk for the new generation You know where to find us Got a reputation Sick podcast, your number one sports destination We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out Cause this is our time No way, no stopping us Till we reach the finish line All in, we came in a win We're gonna give everything S-I-C-K On the run S-I-C-K Sick, sick On fire, we're ready to fight We'll bring the house down tonight S-I-C-K On the run S-I-C-K Sickest podcast, tune in for the audio, or you can even watch back. Giving players all the props, or put them on blast. We don't give no hot takes, only talk back. S I C K, S I C K, S I C K, Turn up your volume, your volume, because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast. Sick Podcast. With Tony Maradero. 55 seconds left in the penalty, a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time. 
Boston four, Montreal three. Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into the mayor back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> there is a ball. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est la You found the dogs! John, you found the dogs! He found the dogs! And all together they worked a young team to the top. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup! Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group, driven to be different. La Vida TV, embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination. It's going to be sick. Marinero, the sick podcast on this Wednesday, April 17th. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, and Twitter Live. We're going to have a good one today because earlier this morning, Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes met with members of the media at the training facility in Brassard to, of course, wrap up the season, officially wrap it up, answer questions from members of the media. And it all started with a very important announcement, which we'll get to in just a couple of minutes. Not before I talk to you about our partners and our sponsors. And I'll start with Energy Transportation Group, a leading full service logistics provider serving all of North America, they are driven to be different. Also, brought to you in part by La Bitta TV, brewed in Quebec and a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bitta TV offers quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone. It's taste La Bitta TV, embrace your true nature. And also brought to you in part by Playground. You don't want to miss Night Fever live at Playground Thursday, April 25th at 8 p.m. Dance the night away and experience the magic of the Bee Gees music in a show that celebrates their timeless legacy. This show will take place under our ground marquee, a beautiful temporary structure that is perfect for electrifying events like this one. Playground, your entertainment destination. Visit playground.ca for tickets. All right, our regular collaborator on Wednesdays throughout Pretty much the entire season has been Craig Button, hockey analyst over at TSN and director of scouting, and no exception tonight as he joins us right now. Craig, how are you? I am great, Tony. How are you doing? I, I'm extremely great, and I think the timing is perfect that you join us tonight, Craig, because you were a former general manager in the National Hockey League among the various hats that you've had in the world of hockey. And so I think you know a lot of what Jeff Gordon was thinking earlier today, what Kent Hughes was thinking. And there's certain things that they're probably thinking that they're not saying, and you could probably touch on that today and elaborate <laughs> it. Uh, there's probably something that comes as no surprise to you, but Kent Hughes wanted to set the tone for the press conference and make a very important announcement right from the very beginning. And it was regarding his coach, Martin St. Louis. Let's hear from Kent Hughes and his announcement. Je voulais uh, annoncer que on a indiqué à Martin St. Louis uh, dans les récents jours que on avait uh, l'intention de prendre, on avait une option dans son contrat. Alors, on a choisi de uh, exercer l'option. Uh, pour nos deux ans, alors ça veut dire que Martin est avec nous pour les prochaines trois ans. And there you have it. So Kent Hughes basically saying, we've let Marty St. Louis know a couple of days ago that in regards to the two years option remaining on his contract, we have decided to exercise those so Marty St. Louis will be under contract with us for the next three seasons. Kent? Isn't that great news? Uh, Kent, Craig, isn't that great news? Well, it's great news for Kent, or he wouldn't have announced it. It's great news for Marty St. Louis. And, and, and when you're working with a young coach, and certainly with somebody that was coming in with, with no significant, without any professional coaching experience to speak of, I, I know he worked with the Columbus Blue Jacks. Some power play. I'm talking about behind the bench as the leader. You, you got to allow that. You got to allow that coach to grow. You got to. He's no different than a young player. You have to work with him, help him develop, help him get comfortable in the NHL. And I, and I think that Martin Saint Louis has done all of those things and more. And when he came in 
a big part of it was to instill a sense of, and, and I, I use this term often, you've heard me say, a, a, a real sense of esprit de corps. And, and that's exactly what you see with the Montreal Canadiens. And it doesn't matter who's in the lineup, they have that uh, th that ability to play together and to, and, and to support one another. And certainly there's lots of, uh, there's lots of real positives with Martin St. Louis as uh, the head coach. And, and now he gets a chance to build on, on the things that he's put into place. The players have familiarity with the, with Martin St. Louis and now allows the Montreal Canadiens to, to, to attempt to take, you know, some more strides forward. For everyone watching, this is the way the show is going to go down tonight. Uh, Kent Hughes spoke, of course, earlier today, like I mentioned, with Jeff Gordon by his side. We're going to touch on that for tonight's show. Over the next couple of days, maybe even into next week, we've heard from all the players, and we're going to try and dissect what they had to say and touch on all of that over the next week or so. Okay. Speaking of players, uh, some announce words, some announcements were made in regards to players earlier today. The Canadians announced that they have loaned Baron, Mayu, Roy, and Struble to the Laval Rocket, who played two huge games for their playoff lives versus Belleville on the weekend on Friday in Belleville and on Saturday in Laval. Joshua Roy has been cleared to return to play. Isn't that good news? All right. Other news from a player perspective, the players were asked if they plan on participating in the Worlds. Samuel Montambo said that he was contacted, but he will not be going. Nick Suzuki said he was contacted, and he is still not sure yet. He's going to take a couple of days before deciding whether he's going to go or not. Caden Gooley said that he was contacted and he will participate. Cole Caulfield has said that he has been contacted and he will participate. And Uri Slavkovsky has said that he has been contacted and he will participate as well. Craig, the fact that in previous years, we've seen different people show up to the table at the year-end postmortem. When Mark Bergevin was the general manager, sometimes it was him alone. Sometimes it was him and his coach, Michel Therrien, for example. Sometimes it was him, his coach, Michel Therrien, Jeff Molson, the owner of the team. Today, it was Hughes with Gorton, uh, which makes a lot of sense for a lot of people because they've sold this as a, uh, as, as, as a, a two-man job. But... Any thoughts you might have on that, the fact that the executive vice president of Hockey Ops was there with the general manager today? I, I think he nailed it, Tony. It's, it, it, it's a two-man job. When, when they hired, when, when Jeff Molson hired Jeff Gorton, he talked about trying to give more support. He, he, and, and Jeff talked about with Mark, he said, you know, I, I look back and I, I don't think that we provided enough support for Mark Bergevin. And, and you, you know, smart people, and Jeff Molson certainly qualifies, uh, are, are going to learn from from the errors or the missteps that they took. And one of the things he talked about is it, is, is it takes more than one person to do the job. Jeff's got tons of experience. You know, Kent comes in as, as somebody that's been around hockey but has never been in the management position with, with a team. So, you know, having them work together, understanding how that can, you know, really be uh, beneficial, not just to – I, the manager can't use not just to Jeff Gordon, but to the overall operation. That's what you're always trying to do is get the most out of your operation. So I, exactly how I thought it, you know, like, I mean, I, I, no surprise there. And I, I think it's important that you come across. I, I, I share this often. People ask me all the time when you have these types of setups, uh, you know, well, who makes the final decision? And I, I was lucky enough to work with Bob Ganey for 10 years. And, you know, he, he, he was a manager, he's a leader, and, and I can never remember a time, I, I, and, and maybe I just d d don't want to remember, but I can never remember a time where we were looking to make a decision, we were considering different things, and Bob just said, this is what we're doing. You know, he, he considered everybody's opinions, he listened, and, and, and Bob was never concerned with what was, like, him being right. He wanted to do what was right for the team. And by the time you went through the exercise, and, and whether, whether it was something you agreed with, whether it was something you fully agreed with, whether, whether it was something you thought maybe there was a different step, 
you knew where you were headed. <laughs> you knew where you landed. And I think that that's, I call it collaboration. I call it the ability to work through your, work through the, uh, the, the problems, the challenges, the solutions, and try to understand what you're trying to do, take in all the input and then go from there. I think good leadership doesn't have to have one person pounding their fist on the table. This is what we're doing. So I think it's effective when you have people that are open-minded and are operating with the idea and with the sense that like everything we do has to be with the, the objective of what's best for the organization. And I don't have any question that Jeff and Kent are, are, are in that regard. So maybe Kent says, hey, here's what I'm thinking. And Jeff goes, have you thought about this? And maybe Kent goes, no, I didn't think about that. That's a good point. Maybe we should think about that. That's collaboration. It's not about just we're doing this and I'm the, and, and I'm because the, then you don't need anybody to work with you. Yeah. And, and hopefully it leads to healthy debate as well. Right. The last thing you want is just everyone agreeing with each other out of loyalty for each other, not wanting to stand each other up. But it seems like when we talk about Jeff Gordon, Kent Hughes, Marty St. Louis, it seems like, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not in their meetings, obviously. I have a <laughs> feeling though that healthy debate does take place. I, I will share a quick story with you. Bob had taken over as general manager uh, with our team in Dallas. Ken Hitchcock had been named the general manager or been named the head coach in, in January of 1996. So we were having meetings. It was, I don't know, middle of February. We're talking. Our team wasn't very good. We weren't in a good place in the standings. Craig Ramsey was a, was a, was a really, a real valuable member of, of our staff, like working with coaches, working with management, working with play. Like he was just so, I mean, I, I said this often about Craig Ramsey. I learned as much from Craig Ramsey as I've learned from anybody in this game. And then, I mean, he's just a brilliant, he's a dear friend and a brilliant person. Anyway, we got into it. We were looking for different areas on our team, and we're looking for areas that could help our team. So we're, we're about how we're going to scout, what we're going to do, how we're going to look through and, and, and work through getting to free agency trades at the draft. And we came up to a third-line center. And, Mike, and Craig Ramsey said, I think Mike Ricci would be an excellent third-line center. Wow. Bob Gainey didn't agree with Craig Ramsey. And they had a pretty good he, they had a pretty good back and forth debate, right? And uh, you know, Bob is telling Craig, I don't agree. Craig's going, well, you better go watch him. He goes, I've watched him, you know, and like it was it was good. But at the end of it, what we came through, and 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 it was really, really, really good. We came through, we said, Hey, listen, here's how we're gonna value it. We're gonna go together if we have disagreement. Anyway, fast forward, we come to our meetings in May. Like, I mean, we've been working and trading information. Bob starts the meeting. You know what the first thing he did was? He said, before we start, the, as we start this meeting, I want to say one thing. Craig Ramsey was absolutely right. Mike Ritchie would be a really good third line center for us. Bob was never about being right for himself. He was about being right for his team. What that signaled to us too, we can have a healthy debate and we can argue our positions. It doesn't mean that Bob wasn't going to make up his own mind or, you know, go against it if he felt that was what was best for the organization. That's healthy. And you learn that and you watch it and you go, hey, we can have these good, honest, hard debates. And we leave not scarred or bruised, but understanding that this was an exercise that helps us all be better and ultimately the team try to meet its objectives. Let's go back to the fact that Marty St. Louis has the opportunity to coach this team now for the next three years, which I think was was a really big announcement. Uh, in the last month, Marty St. Louis at one point left the team for about a week uh, because his son had suffered um, a hockey injury, was hospitalized. It was a little bit of a setback, and his son and his family needed him. And at that point, a lot of us said, must be really tough for Marty to be separated from his family, who, you know, his wife and one son are in Connecticut and the other two boys are somewhere else. And hockey's his passion and he loves to coach, but he loves his family more than anything else. Very understandably so. And some of us wondered, you know, how long Marty would want to do this more knowing that the thing he loves the most, his family, um, he's separated from. And obviously, he's got a real good, um, strong family 
who are supporting him. And the decision was made that, you know what? Um, we're going to be okay. Let's, let's, let's move forward here. This is a huge announcement that was made today from a coach that I think did a marvelous job in helping grow and develop um, a lot of players on the team, especially very important ones. Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes were both asked to weigh in on Marty St. Louis and certain things that they saw either now or in the past that convinced them that Marty St. Louis was the person for the job to lead this team. Let's hear first from Jeff Gordon on Marty St. Louis and next from Kent Hughes on Marty St. Louis. I think Marty, the thing about him is every day he proves something else. You know, it's, it's, it's we don't even know who he is yet. It feels like he's, there's still more. And uh, that's hard to do in this business. And, uh, you know, I, I personally see the way he, he talks to the media. He talks, he treats everybody so well. Um, he's very respectful. He carries himself uh, really well in front of the team. Um, and then, obviously, the hockey part, right? So there's a lot to him. And uh, I think uh, he takes pride in the fact that he's always getting better. And I, uh, we see that. Kent and I talk about it all the time. He's, uh, he's you know, we've said it a number of times. He, he's very impressive. And, and he's the right person for, for what we're doing. And, uh, you know, there's not a day that goes by where we're not happy that, you know, he's, he's at the helm and he's, he's, at, he's you know, he's out front. He's, he's the point person for, for our franchise. And we're, we're very proud of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer, I'm going to do it in English because I want to touch on the playoff thing and make sure I'm more lucid about it. But the starting point with Marty, I would say this. I, I don't know how many years ago we were at a, uh, the two of us were at a camp for the top young kids in the U.S. and Marty spoke. And I think it was him and Brian Savage, so two people with, with uh, links to the Montreal Canadiens organization. And during Marty's speech to these kids, who were probably 13, 14 at the time, he said, I wasn't the biggest, clearly. I wasn't the fastest. I wasn't the most talented. The one thing I did better than everybody else was get better. And I think he brings that same mentality to coaching. He doesn't believe he has all the answers he's able to reflect on what he's doing as a coach what we need to do as a team take input from the analytics group about where we appear to be deficient data wise uh, at least what the data is saying and then work to come up with solutions uh, and I, I think that's true of our whole coaching staff so uh, that gives us reassurance that where we see issues they're bright and motivated and dedicated to fixing those uh, isn't that amazing information and amazing opinions? First, Jeff Gordon, then Kent Hughes. Jeff Gordon says, Marty continues to do more, continues to show us more, and continues to prove more. That's very, very hard to do in hockey. It Basically, the translation to me sounds like Marty is like the players in development, and the development is working, and he's getting better every day. Kent Hughes adds a story that when Marty St. Louis spoke to young hockey players age 13 and 14, he said to them, I wasn't the fastest. I wasn't the most skilled player. I wasn't the best player. But what I had over all the other players was the ability to get better. And he got better every day as a player, the way he's getting better every day as a coach. And then he added, he has the ability to sit down with our analytics department to see where we need to improve and to come up with solutions. Everything you heard. I know you're not surprised by any of this because you've spoken at length about your admiration for Marty St. Louis, the person, the player, and now the coach and how much you believe in him. But based on everything you heard, what can you add? Well, I, I will add this. Marty was a really talented player. You know, I watched him in midget I watched him in, in junior A. I watched him in college. I watched him in the American Hockey League. He, he was, <laughs> I think he's selling himself a little bit short. I, I think the, the, the part about improvement, Marty St. Louis didn't really come into his own as an NHL player until he was 26 years of age. Think about that. 
Just stop and think about that for a second. 26 years of age. He, he had dominated everywhere. He had dominated all the way up to there and, you know, couldn't find his way into the NHL. And uh, I'm, like, like when I'm, I'm talking about the Marty St. Louis, we, we, we came to know, we came to love as a Hall of Famer, that player. And, and so there's a persistence there. And, and part, of, part of persistence is also learning as you go. And, and that becomes really significant. Lots of, like persistence is, is, is a great quality to have and determination and trying to find ways to get, but you got to understand what it, what, what you got to do to, so it took Marty a little bit longer to take all these skills and be able to apply them. But the persistence, the understanding and learning, once you stop learning, one of two things are, are happening. Either, you know, everything. So just check out of the world because there's nothing more for you to know, or you're just plain ignorant. And so to me, like when you want to continuously learn and you want to continuously get better, I think that it speaks volumes about, hey, new information comes, new experiences, reflection on what I did, reflection and analysis of what I can do better and trying to understand. I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring up a, a former Montreal athlete who played for the Expos, Terry Francona. And Terry Francona, great manager in Major League Baseball. I don't know if you know who Bill James is. Bill James is considered the father of sabermetrics uh, in, in, in baseball. All the analytics, all the stuff. Long before anybody was talking about analytics, Bill James was doing it. He got, uh, he got hired by the Boston Red Sox. And he was working. Terry Francona was the manager. Bill James was working in the office doing all the all the analytics, all the data. And in, in Bill James's book, it's called The Mind of Bill James, he talks about Terry Francona. He said, Terry Francona has all these great experiences as a player. And I have these, the, the, this really, what I believe, really strong understanding of the data and the analytics. And he said, what I know is this, is that Terry Francona understands all the data, he understands from his own playing experiences, you know, the, the feel for the game. He understands from his managing perspective what may have to happen at any point in time. But this is where Bill said, this is what really impressed me about Bill, and this gets to, to Marty St. Louis. Bill said, he goes, I know whatever decision Terry Francona is undertaking and ultimately makes, that he has considered all the options. He's considered the data. He's considered his own playing experiences. He's considered his own magic. He goes, that's all you can ask. He said, it might not be exactly what I would do, but I know that Terry Francona has armed himself to the nth degree to, 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 to give himself the best chance to make the best decision in that moment. That to me is, is what Martin St. Louis is doing according to Kent Hughes. And that to me is, a, it's not about this is right and that's wrong or that's wrong and this is right. It's about understanding. And there's times when you, okay, what does the data tell us? Okay, well, let me just see. Well, okay, what, what, what are you seeing, Marty? I used the word earlier, Tony, collaboration. Like if you think you're just going to operate in silos in, in a major organization, in, a, in, in the Montreal Canadiens organization, you, you're, you're stuck. You're not going to be able to have success. Marty St. Louis is all about success. So that's that's what I can add to those comments by Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon. And, and I will say this just really quickly, what Jeff Gordon said, and, and I do believe this about Martin St. Louis, is that, you know, every day he impresses. Every day. And it, it, think about it. 26 years old, he's making his, his real foray into the National Hockey League, like as, as, as a player that's finding his way. And he ends up being a Hall of Famer. 26 years old. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Dominic Kasich was actually even a little bit older than that, was he not? But uh, also another amazing story, right? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. But like, you, you know, it's yeah. it's rare, right? But but at the same time, yeah. how you learn, how you grow, and you know, and 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 I know Kent is very modest and everything, but Kent's son Jack and and Marty's son Ryan came up together. They were playing together. You know, they played together at the USA National Team Development Program. So when when Kent hired Marty St. Louis, color me the least surprised person on the planet because I knew that they had a really yeah. good relation, a long-standing relationship, and Kent had seen a lot of things that he liked about Martin St. Louis. All right. Jeff Gordon was asked 
what's the biggest challenge right now? And he had a little bit of a funny response, uh, but then he did elaborate. Um, let's hear from Jeff Gordon. Biggest challenge or concern? Um, this press conference. <laughs> um, if somebody has a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm, really, it's just uh, what's next. You know, I, I think we all... In this business, for, for me, for everybody, it's like, what do we got to do now? You know, the season's over. Um, we're going to talk to our players. Um, each individual just mentally kind of go through what that, what we want to say to our players. Um, talk to the coaches, go through the whole organization, um, what we have to do, make sure we're all on the same page. You know, the draft, free agency, there's a lot of important things. So it's hard to say one thing, but it's a huge summer for us. You know, we want to, uh, we want to set us up uh, pretty well. All right, so the biggest uh, ch uh, concern, challenge, is the press conference. He's got, uh, he's got an earpiece on, of course, and uh, the questions that are in French are being translated in English. And uh, so he joked about that. Uh, but then he said it's, it's about really what we're going to do next. Um, there's a lot of things to do next, but obviously he's referring to making the right decisions because one bad decision can set you back a little bit. And so... He's got a template, which was the New York Rangers when he did the rebuild there. And he was asked, when you were with the Rangers, you executed at a certain point. When will you know when you have to execute with the Canadians the way you executed with the Rangers? When are you certain of when the right timing is? Listen carefully. You're often asked about the comparison with what you did in New York with the Rangers. And yeah. Obviously, we see how successful we are right now. Um, not to just hammer in on that comparison, but you know, the question that Alex just asked about the, the moment, mm -hmm. um, that process of coming up with that decision in New York, and how do you, of, of the right time to hit? Obviously, circumstances kind of played into it, but you know, how can you take that experience and apply it? Here in Montreal, in terms of timing and, and just knowing when it's appropriate to to go and and hit the gas pedal, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I want to say you just know when it's time, when when the right thing comes along in in whatever package it comes, whether it's a trade or whatever it, whatever it is, right? Free agency. Um, you know, we did some things there that I think sped it up. Um, it's worked out pretty well for them. Um, so you know, that's what we're looking for, right? We're we're at the point where you know we have a lot of assets. Uh, we have a lot of good, good players. Um, it's it's moving in the right direction, and and that's you know for Kent and I and and Marty uh, to to figure out you know what that is. And uh, I, it's it's a hard thing to answer because you just don't you know we're, we'd be speculating on what that could be. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, when the right time is and uh, you know we all feel comfortable we're moving in the right direction we just want to make sure that uh, you know we have a plan and that we're not doing something short term to deviate from what we want to be long term right so yeah yeah i think i mean listen we we all you know listen if there's a free agent out there that a, a great one that could that could really help us you know we're we'll be looking right so um if there's a trade, you know, like we've made a number of trades since we got here that uh, have helped that, I think, move it along. Been the right age players. It's a different. That's a different way of doing it. So, those are all conversations we're going to have. You know, this is the day after the season ended, so uh, we'll go through that. But, you know, it's a, it's a team that's showed us a lot, and uh, you know, I think we'll we'll spend this summer trying to figure out if we can move that forward. When will they know? Craig, if you were the GM of this team, if you were Jeff Gordon or Kent Hughes, what are some of the indicators you would be looking at um, and some of the um, maybe the um, the options out there outside of your organization? What are some of the things you're looking at to know when the right time is to pounce and execute? 
Well, I, I would suggest that they've already recognized times to pounce. You know, look at Kirby Dock. I mean, you, you know, look at Alex Newhook. I mean, the, when you try to think about what you're trying to do to try to move your team, and Jeff talked about the right age, you know, the, a, a, an age frame and what you're trying to do, they've already demonstrated that they're going to pounce if, if an opportunity arises. And, and that also means, hey, listen, we're going to trade somebody if it means we can get a first round draft pick or we can get a prospect back. So, you know, now you're, and, and Jeff touched on this in, in his answer. He, he mentioned that, you know, you're watching your team. You're watching to see how they're doing. We're, we're paying close attention. So what you, what you want to be able to do is, is look at your team and say, okay, how, how is Nick Suzuki handling, you know, the number one center role? Okay, what, what kind of growth is Cole Caulfield having? What kind of, you know, we drafted Uri Slavkowski first overall. What kind of growth is he having? You, you're, you're taking information in from your coaching staff. And, okay, what, what, what does it mean with Samuel Montembeau to be our starting goaltender? Caden Gooley, where is he at? And you, you're watching them take these steps and and then and then once you once you're satisfied with the steps that they're taking and and they can really hold their spot what happens in a lot of cases tony is you're looking at players and you're going yeah well he's okay but you know i don't think there's any question nick suzuki's the number one center but a lot of teams as they're going through a rebuild they're looking at a set and they're going yeah well okay we got but, but you don't have a number one center so how do you know and and you got to go find one and understanding what you can do to support your group and to add to your group i'll give you an example and, and 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 just right there's a lot of things you don't know so you have to be flexible in your thinking you have to be flexible with your with your cap space because opportunities are going to rise that we don't even know right now I, like I, I, and, and that's the speculation part in the summer of 1995 we were looking, we looked at our team, we had Mike Madonna, we had a lot of good young players, and we looked at, at, at free agency. And we were trying to sign Ray Ferraro because we wanted a center that could play, you know, alongside Mike Madonna or be a really good second line center. We were not able to get Ray Ferraro. He wasn't the only player we had tried to get as a center, but, but we had identified, Madonna was a superstar, he was a franchise center. Now we're looking and then, well, all of a sudden we get to August and there's rumblings that Joe Newendike's going to hold out. So from that he was not going to go back to Calgary. Well, all of a sudden, there's an opportunity that was presented to us, and now we start to talk about it. We start to have discussions about it. Ultimately, we made the trade, and it was a, it was a significant trade. We traded a, a great young prospect in Jerome McGinley, and we got exactly what we were looking for uh, to, to be able to compete. You, you ought to be looking at the teams around you as well. So we're able to, to to have Mike, and now we got Joe. I mean, we two Hall of Famers, right? Like, but we didn't know that in June. We didn't know that, and 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 you, you got to be you got to be patient with yourself, and then you got to be ready to take advantage when it comes. And people will say, "Geez, you know, like, are you going to pay a price? You're going to do that?" Well, there's a price also for not for not acting, right? And what was yeah. that price? And I, I told you a story about Bob. I, I, when we were coming down to the to, to really, I mean, we knew we knew what we were headed. But we we had Madano, Hatcher, Matt Fitchuk, Lettman, Lagenbrunner. We had a, 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 an excellent group of young players, and we we knew Jerome was going to be an NHL player and a good one. We would we, we underestimated how great he would be. We we knew we had a really good prospect. But we talked about like we got to help those guys right now. We can continue to accumulate young players. But they're not going to help the Madonnas. They're not going to help the Hatchers. We needed to do something that was going to help those players because we had spent so much development time on them. And ultimately, Joe came in. It was fantastic for us, obviously. But that's that's where you got to and, – and, and remember, this was in 1995, like in December. Our team wasn't very good. We weren't close to a Stanley Cup or competing. We, we, were, we were at a place where we were not very good. So understanding – what you're trying to do, and then being able to, 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 to look at an opportunity and say, this is a good one. We better take advantage of it. Jeff has tons of experience. I think for Kent to have Jeff there is unbelievable. I, I know we talk a lot about the New York Rangers when it comes to Jeff Gordon. A lot of people don't go back far enough. The Boston Bruins team in 2011 that won the Stanley Cup, just go back and look at the work that Jeff Gordon did with that Boston Bruins team. His fingerprints are all over that team, all over it. He wasn't the manager at the time. Jeff Gordon has been through this twice. 
and he's, he's he's now stealing himself for the third time. I will say this: I think that uh, you have every reason to have full faith in Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes. You know what I loved about the press conference today? And by the way, I love every time Marty St. Louis has press conferences as well because they don't give you <laughs> cliches. Um, they're, they have a lot of respect, I find, for the fan base and for members of the media because they'll give you a lot of information. They do. And I love that about this management team and this coach. What I loved about listening to them speak today is, once again, they gave us a lot of tips they gave us a lot of hints. There were a lot of triggers there. Listen very carefully to Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes asked about if they have identified core players that could be part of a cup run. For me, this is one of the most telling parts of the entire presser today that it seems like not too many other people in the media are talking about. And I, I found it extremely intriguing. Listen Opponents carefully. do you believe you currently have within your core that you would consider to be part of a core of a potential Stanley Cup winner down the line? Oh. Oh, that's tough. The players are listening to this too, right? <laughs> right? Um, well, I mean, I think, listen, like we said at the beginning of the year, it's it's about growth and who's getting better and who's at their ceiling and who still can who still has more to go. Um, and I th I still think we have like you see Nick um, Suzuki season is uh, maybe some people thought he was where he was last year and that's gonna gonna be where it was. But he had a great year. He showed uh, his ability to be a number one center for the franchise. I think um, so. That's huge for us and a, and a huge piece, right? So um, you see Slavkovsky, you know, maybe 12 months ago in this room, people are maybe looking at us like we didn't know what we're doing, right? So, but now it's a year later and he looks like he's going to be a really good player, right? So, um, and Sam Montembeau's emergence as, as, uh, as a really good goalie. So there's a lot of good things happening in this organization. Um, to put a number on, uh, you know, wh the core, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that we have people in this organization that are going to be our core that haven't identified that yet, haven't haven't had the opportunity, that may not even be with us yet. So it's hard to say that. Um, but to answer, like, I, there's a lot of good players here. There's a lot of good young players coming. Um, it's really exciting. I mean, the first part of your question was, how do you feel about the opportunity to take this to kind of the next level? Uh, we're excited. And... Uh, you know, it's a big job. This is the part right now where it's probably going to be the hardest, where we're identifying who's who's going to be part of that, and uh, as we move forward, and uh, you know, it's really exciting. But it's also the fun part of putting a team together, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we're right in what we're. All right, forget about what you just heard for a second. If I would have asked you, Craig, who have you identified as part of your core? that could be part of a potential cup run. I would ask you who you would have identified. And then I would ask you who you think Jeff Gordon would have identified. Who would you have said? Well, a couple of things that we got to, we got to establish here. And, I, and I'm going to call them the ground rules here. How do people define core? Like, you know, Jeff said, we got a lot of good players there. Right, and he said we might have players that, that they're going to be part of our core that aren't even aren't even here yet, which gives you some indication that they're looking in different areas of the franchise, which is which is really significant, right? So that being said, you know you can look at it and you can look, you know, part of the problem, and and, and it is a problem. It's a problem in Montreal because Montreal, you can look at all the Stanley Cup winners, you can look at them, I can look at them, and we can go core, core, core. Who fits that piece of thing? Well, you know what they talk about in Columbus. They don't know what a core looks like because they've never had any success. So the Montreal Canadiens tradition is something to be celebrated, but it's also something that people got to recognize that, like, we're not back in, 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 the, in 1986 or in the 1970s. We're not there anymore. And, and, and so it's a nice benefit. It's a nice place to be able to talk about the greatness of the Montreal Canadiens. But – Jeff has, has, has been somebody that talks about, you know what, we're going to continue to work. We're going to try to put players into place. You need good players to win. 
You know, we traded for Daryl Sador in, 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 in Dallas from the LA Kings. He was the seventh overall pick. And did we think he was a core player? No. Did we think that the, the LA Kings didn't think he was a core player? He became a core player for us. So there's given opportunity, given a right setting, given a situation where players can, can perform to the best of their abilities. There's a lot that goes into team building. I, I've said all along that, that Nick Suzuki is a core player. He's number one center. I think Caden Gooley is going to be a core player. And, and, and like, I don't like, you know, how do we define when are they there, when are they not? Slavkovsky's showing every sign that he's a core player. I think Cole Caulfield is an excellent player. Cole Caulfield, I, I, I'm amazed that people talk about that he didn't have a great year this year. Great year. Okay. Like, I don't know what you, what more you want from Cole Caulfield. And so there's lots of good, and there's lots of good prospects in the system and, and everything. But I don't know how many core players you need to, to, to win. And, and the part of the problem in Montreal, and it is a problem, everybody wants yeah. to go, oh, Lafleur, Robinson, LaPointe, Savard, Dryden, you know? Yeah, well, great. It was a different time. Go back to the New York yeah. Islanders. Tell me who the New York Islanders' core players were. They won four cups in a row. Who were they? Brian Trottier, Mike Bossy, Dennis Pavin, Billy Smith. Um, well, Full yeah, stop. Finale, Nystrom. Full stop. Full stop. No, Bobby Nyshen was a really good was a good player on a good team. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, Bernie Perrant, Bernie Perrant, Bobby Clark. You know, you want me to go through the Edmonton Oilers here? They're clear? Like it, it was Fear, it yeah. was Coffee, it was Gretzky, it was Messier Curry. Like, like there's four or five on a team. That's all there is. That's yeah, all there is. The and then why, you got to you know, build was, it around them. You know, it, it's funny you say that because you know, I brought up Bobby Nystrom or John Tonelli or Clark Gillies, for example. Like, those are complementary players, I know. But all depending on if your team really needs players like that, you can actually say, well, they're part of my core, right? But I, I, I get the question, but I need you to think about this, Craig. What an incredibly interesting answer that he gave us. Because yeah. he said there's players that are core players. There's players who are not yet here who can be core players. There's players that still remains to be answered if they can be core players. Now, think about the Canadians. They got Suzuki. They got Slavkowski. They got Caulfield. They got Kirby Doc. They got Mike Matheson. They got Caden Gooley. But the three answers that Jeff Gordon gave are Suzuki, Slavkowski, and Samuel Montembeau. All I've been hearing for the last year is that when the Canadians are ready to go to the promised land, the guy who's going to take them there is going to be Jacob Fowler. I haven't heard anyone say that when they're ready for prime time, it's going to be Montembeau. Out of the three players that Jeff Gordon mentioned, Montembeau is one of them. Are you not shocked by this? No. I got almost fell off my chair. Mike Johnson has it on the uh, – Mike John or Carlo Koliakovo has him on his Olympic team in 2026. You know, again – like there's lots of things you're looking for when you're trying to identify players that you feel you, you, you can really sit down and say they're a pillar player and you, you're watching for improvement. You're watching for how a player takes in information, how he's, how he's developing, how he's, how he's taking, like, you know, again, I talked about Marty St. Louis, 26 years old before he really started to show what he was capable of. How old is Samuel Montembeau? Oh, yeah, you're right there. So it doesn't mean because you haven't doesn't mean you can't. You talked about Dominic Hasek earlier. So when you're talking about Samuel Montembeau, all the things you're looking for, things we see in games, things we don't see in games, the practice, how you're dealing with him, how he takes his craft seriously, what he's trying to do. And and, and so you, under, you, you try to take all those things and you try to understand, okay, this is what we have here, and this is why I can say that. And the, the, I think one of the key things in identifying, like the Jeff used the word puzzle, is knowing and, and believing it, not, not so much knowing, but believing that a player put into a, into a proper situation can, can, can take advantage of the opportunity because you put them in a best spot. They, you know, over the years – I, I heard this. I, I lived in Michigan for 12 years. I was right there during the heyday of the Red Wings. 
You'll never win with Steve Eiserman. Oh, you won't win with Steve Eiserman. I'll take my chances. Oh, you won't win with Ovechkin. Oh, really? I, I heard that about Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe. Now, I know Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe didn't win a cup. I'll take my chances with Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe. And we can talk about how you build a team. There's one team that wins. By and the way, certainly, some people I'll take my chances. By the way, some people are saying that about Connor McDavid. And, and so I say this. I mean, sure. I pray to God. I, 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 I really hope that Connor McDavid uh, leads the Edmonton Oilers to the Stanley Cup this year. Like, I really do. Like, I, you know, there's so many people I'm rooting for in hockey, but yeah. I'd love to see McDavid win the Stanley Cup because one of the best players of all time, I don't care what anybody says, I think he's proven that already. He deserves to win a Stanley Cup because if he doesn't end up winning one, you're going to get one or two people that are going to say, you see, Connor McDavid couldn't lead the Emmett Norris to the Stanley Cup. I hope that doesn't happen. Anyway. No, and you're right. So so people say that Joe Thornton. Uh, Joe Thornton and Patrick Morrow played hard. They played good. They were top players. Yeah. Jerome Ginla. You don't want Jerome Ginla on your team? You don't want Connor McDavid on your team or Leon Dreisaitl? Give me a break. I will say this right here and right now. People that want to take that argument, it's a stupid argument. So don't okay. make a stupid argument and make yeah. yourself look stupid. Now, when when Jeff Gordon was asked, who have you identified as your core players that can be part of a cup run one day? The first things he said were the players are listening to this, right? So <laughs> he knows the players are listening and he knows the players are watching. He didn't include Cole Caulfield. Now, we know they have a lot of confidence in Cole Caulfield, you know, we're less than a year removed from them giving him an eight-year contract extension to make him the second highest paid player on the team at $7.85 million per season, just $250,000 less per season than their captain, Nick Suzuki. But my question to you is, why do you think he didn't include him in that core? I mean, he left them out for a reason. It's not because, you know, he just didn't come to the top of his head. He left them out for a reason. What do you think that doubt is? What do you think that concern is? Why do you think he just didn't include him in that list of three? You're asking me a question. You're asking me to speculate, and it's all hypotheticals now. So, like, you know, Jeff doesn't speculate. I, I can speculate till the cows come home, and I can have my own opinion on it, and maybe Jeff doesn't agree with me, right? And that's okay. Maybe he forgot. Maybe he maybe he didn't want to mention other players, and maybe he did. He didn't mention Caden Gooley. So are we all upset about he didn't mention Caden Gooley, who's shown that he can be a pillar on a blue line. In my view, Cole Caulfield is is a good player. Now I will say this: Hey, listen, if there's an opportunity out there, and you can, I always told our players, and 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 I always told our players, I'm not looking to make changes here all the time. But if I can make a move that improves our team, anybody, I will consider any player on our team. Any player on our team, I'll consider if I think it makes our team better. And I think that's the open-mindedness you have to have. And I don't think it's necessary to sit down and say, players know if you believe in them. I don't think it becomes a big deal in, in, in the public sphere. For, for If Cole Caulfield understands his place in the team, and, and whether, he, whether, whether they're not sure about him, whether they want him to work on other things, or they are sure about him, eight-year contract seems to feel, because this, this is the group that gave him the eight-year contract, Tony. And yes, of course. And so so, so, so th there's other ways to value a player than stand, sitting in a press conference and mentioning his name. So I'll leave it at that. Maybe Kent Hughes gave us the answer, and we're going to end with this tonight. Kent Hughes elaborated on identifying a core player already or identifying a core player going forward. Here's Kent Hughes. Gresham rarely being linear that, you know, I, I think Slaff uh, is a great example, by and large has had a huge jump, but I expect that he'll go sideways again before he gets to his ultimate, you know, point, uh, peak in terms of his game and, and that's going to be the same for a lot of players so we need to evaluate that see how they handle when hockey players struggle you start to see the mental resilience that they have and, and those types of cues really give us a better indication of who's really part of the core the guys that we know are going to be able to go here and get back up here when hockey players struggle 
then you see the mental resilience of getting back. And those are some of the cues we look for to see who will be a core player going forward. Isn't that something? Well, but 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 it's true. And 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 I think it's important to just talk about, you know, mental health too. You know, you want to put your players into a in, in, into a place where not only are their physical health uh, always at the forefront, but their mental health as well. I, I would say this, Tony, people don't need support when things are going well. They need support when things aren't going well. And that to me is 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 something that, you know, you wouldn't put a player, you wouldn't put Kirby Doc into the lineup last night, you know, because he's not a hundred percent. So when players are struggling and and men, so so you have to understand that whole part. You know, just because a player might not be able to do something at a particular point in time, doesn't mean he won't. Doesn't mean he can't. So you, you you're evaluating all of that as well. And 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 you're trying to understand. Okay, what does it mean, and 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 how do you support them, and who can who can take some of that pressure? I, I tell a story about Mike Keane and Mike Madano. We had traded for Mike Keane, and we're playing. In, it was in it was in 1998. We're playing San Jose, and we had lost Joe Newendijk in the first game of the playoffs. And Mike Madano is the one that told me the story. He said, we're sitting in San Jose. I believe the series was 2-1. He goes, we're in a real battle. It's a hard team to play against. We're playing. He goes, it's halfway through the game. And he goes, and I'm feeling anxious. And somewhere along the line, he goes, Mike Keane sensed that I was feeling anxious. He said, Mike Madano said, Keener just put his hand on my arm. And he just said, just relax. Just keep doing what you're doing. He said, you know, it's good enough. Our team is good. You don't have to do more. He goes, don't do less, but just keep doing what you're doing. We'll, we'll be okay. Mike had this feeling that he had to do more, had to do more. Things weren't going exactly how he wanted. Pressure, you know, it's a tight game. It's tied. And he goes, Mike Keane just settled him right down. How important is that? How important is that for understand? It's not that Mike Medano didn't have mental resiliency. It was that Mike Medano had, had this com- complete desire to, to find a way to help the team win. And all Mike Keane reminded him of us, we're a team. Do you just keep doing what you're doing? You're a great player and everything will be fine. Mike said he just felt this sense of calm come over his whole body. And he said he never forgot that. Now, that's the influence of, like, that's management that can influence you in that way. There's coaches that can influence, and there's teammates that can influence you in that way. And that's really important in, in all the aspects. It's not just saying, oh, yeah, you know, it's like, and I understand what Kent is, is saying. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to. Uh, uh, make any criticism of that, but there's a lot of things that go into that. Mike Madano, who had a great 20 plus year career in the National Hockey League, Hockey Hall of Famer with 561 goals, with 1,374 points, with 146 playoff <laughs> points in 176 games, with a Stanley Cup who had one milestone left to achieve, play 1,500 games in the National Hockey League, had a chance to do it versus his former team when he was playing with Detroit under Mike Babcock, who decided to make him a healthy scratch in the final game of the season and lets him end his career at 1,499 games. Mike Mike Babcock is a dirtbag. That's a dirtbag move, man. That's a dirtbag move. He had a lot move. of them in his career. He had a lot of them in his career. And this is somebody that was a very capable coach, but a dirtbag. Talk about ruining a legacy, eh? I just... Um, his, it, yeah, well, his own more than anybody. Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, hey, listen, uh, but Mike Madano was really just a fantastic, fantastic hockey player. Craig, amazing insight as usual. I, I've mentioned before on the podcast that just because the Montreal Canadian season came to an end, uh, it does not spell an end to my season here and our season here on the SICK podcast. Uh, we're going to find topics going forward. It's They're going to be a lot more abbreviated shows. We're probably going to go down from like 60 minutes on average to maybe 30 minutes on average, but we're definitely going to find a lot of topics and I'm hoping that you'll continue to join me every now and then I realize you're not going to be available all the time, but everyone loves you so much and your contributions that I'm hoping that you'll be able to join me more often than not. When, when, when have I not been available and good luck getting us down to 30 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Craig button. 
uh, TSN Director of Scouting and Hockey Analyst with TSN. Uh, thanks so much, Craig. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. Cheers, my man. All right, there you have it. Marinero, once again, special thanks to Energy Transportation Group. Special thanks to Labitta TV. Special thanks to Playground. Special thanks to all of our partners and all of our sponsors. And special thanks to you, our sick army and our sick community, for being there all the time. It's an appointment. It's a rendezvous. It's weeknights at 10 p.m. Leave us a five-star review if you can on Apple. It's our way of feeling the love. Uh, comment sick S I C K share this with your friends and tell all your friends who haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet that a it's absolutely free and B it's absolutely worth it. We'll be back tomorrow night. Same time, same place for in yellow and Sammy at master control. They're Cavallaro. I'm Marinaro. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast with Tony Marinaro on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination.